Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So today's lesson, lesson number 11, end time deceptions. Whoa. That's not pertinent today now, is it? <laughs> yes. Very but, much so. Exactly. But before we begin, David, could you lead us out in prayer? Absolutely. Let's pray. Our loving Lord Jesus Christ, Father God and Holy Spirit, we are here on the Sabbath day so that we can get that rest from you, Lord, the rest that teaches us that everything that we have in this earth, everything that we go through, every questions, every struggles that we have, Lord, we need to depend on you and your guidance and wisdom. We know that in the end time, Satan will come and deceive us, but we know that the greater power is you. Greater is he who is in me than who is in the world. In that note, Lord, I ask that be with each and every one of us who will be watching this Sabbath school lesson and who will be coming and joining us and also be with us so each one of us can speak from the Holy Spirit and not of our own. Please forgive our sins and be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to start off by reading the memory verse. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 14 and 15. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. And that is just the beginning. Satan was doing that at the time of Jesus and in the early church. Matthew 24, verses 24 through 27 say, say for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead if possible even the elect behold i have told you in advance so if they say to you behold he is in the wilderness do not go out or behold he is in the inner rooms do not believe them for just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Could the devil really pull off impersonating Jesus, impersonating God? Revelation 13, 13 says, he performs great signs so that even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth and the presence of men. Have we ever seen this in scripture before? Well, we have. Job 1, 16, while he was still speaking, Another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Was it really God who sent that fire? Who was it who was allowed to do all this to Job? It was the devil. Okay, so Jesus raised the dead, right? Several times that we know of, Lazarus was dead for four days before Christ raised him. True that the devil cannot give the breath of life to a person or raise him from the dead, but is he not the father of lies for a reason? On January 10th, 2018, Business Insider reported on a man that had been pronounced dead by three different physicians. It's a true story. The Spanish newspaper La Voz de Asturias stated that Gonzalo Montoya Jimenez was sent to the morgue and regained consciousness only a few hours before an autopsy was to be performed. It's amazing, in the article, they actually had him marked up and everything, and where to cut. They linked, the med they linked all this to a medical condition called um, catalepsy. Um, basically, that's how they accounted it. But do you think the devil could make somebody look like they were dead? and then raise them from the dead or bring them back to life, I'm going to lay odds so. Because remember Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. How rooted are you in God's word? Do we know scripture? Can we read the Bible and by the Holy Spirit have discernment to understand it? We live in a world that is saturated by Satan, his thoughts and his lies. 
Let's take media, for instance. You remember that movie Ghost? With Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore? Not even death could separate their love as he was looking after his living wife. I think at the end, though, he finally does go to heaven because everyone goes to heaven in the movies just about. But, um, and that's just one of the hundreds of movies selling the lie of an eternal soul. How about the movie with Noah, um, basically with Russell Crowe in it? How biblical was it? I'm giving it about maybe 10%. Yes, I have seen it. It's about 10% biblically accurate. Remember the Omen series with Davian, the son of the devil, and the battle of Armageddon? Throw in some Bible verses and people will believe almost anything. Well, it's got the Bible in it. It must be true, right? Only after I read the Bible did I realize just how many lies I believed about God. Seriously. The devil has pretty much most of the world that fooled. Ellen G. White reads, or states in The Great Controversy, page 524, among the most successful agencies of the great deceiver are the delusive teachings and lying wonders of spiritualism. Disguised as an angel of light, he spreads his nets where least suspected. If men would but study the book of God with earnest prayer that they might understand it, they would not be left in darkness and receive false doctrines. But as they reject the truth, they fall prey to deception. So let me ask you, have you ever heard of the New Age movement? You know, they're usually maybe tree huggers or a little fluffy or some of the other labels, but it's simply what it means. It's a rejuvenation of the same old stories that have been around for thousands of years. So let's take a look at the chart here. Um, we're going to see six in ten Christians hold at least one of these new age beliefs to be true in their minds. And we have to believe in spiritual energy can be located in physical things. We have believing in psychics. We have believing in reincarnation and we have believing in astrology. So at least one of those four, six out of 10 Christians believe. That's 60%. Spiritual energy, crystal, special stones, how something feels, everything has like its own inner being, whether it be an animal or a rock or whatever, especially with crystals. Psychics. You would be surprised at the things they will tell you because the fallen angels are telling them. The devil knows us better than we think. And I actually t spoke with a, a gentleman about this who's SDA. And he went and he said, this woman told me things nobody could know. She told me things that it has to be true. And when I explained to him just what I said on how she's getting those answers, he realized he'd been duped by the devil. Reincarnation, we'll talk about that extensively today. So we'll wait until that, um, it's a little bit later because that is kind of, yeah, a handful in its own right. Astrology, and I'm not talking about your horoscope in your newspaper. This is an intricate method that may be described, may, might describe you better than you think. Another of Satan's tricks, remember Eve got in trouble when she responded to the serpent, serpent's dialogue. Jesus in the wilderness responded to the devil with scripture. He did not engage him in conversation. So this week we're going to specifically be looking at mysticism. Where, in, this, in this lesson, where have you built your house? Is it on the rock of Christ or on the sands of man? Near-death experiences and how people have been to heaven or hell and they have their recollection of it. Reincarnation, the internal soul that lives many times over, whether it be in plants, insects, or people. Necromancy, consulting the dead, and ancestor worship. Oh boy, I can't wait to get to that one. And persons and other appearances. I will say this, this one I've had personal experience with. Um, my mother, when my father died, about two weeks later, my mom said, yeah, I saw your dad. 
He came, he got a cup of coffee, and he sat with me for about 20 minutes. Never said a word, but she felt that he was there to comfort her. It's alive and well. These are all important topics for us to truly understand, but we truly have to know so we can stand firm in Christ in the last days. Barbara, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, mysticism? Yes, our world is flooded with waves of mysticism. Boy. It's a complex term, too, and it encapsulates a, a variety of huge ideas. If you look at, in the dictionary, it says the experience of mysticism, mystical union or direct communion with ultimate reality as reported by mystics. Secondly, the belief that direct knowledge of God, spiritual truth, or ultimate reality can be, a be obtained through a subjective experience, such as in intuition or insight. And three, a vague speculation, a belief without sound basis. I thought that was interesting. A vague speculation, a belief without sound basis. Or a theory postulating the possibility of direct and intuitive acquisition of ineffable, and that word means too big to be expressed, an, an ineffable knowledge of, or power. So, um, uh, an example that we see today of, of mysticism is in the charismatic movement, with its emphasis on dreams, visions, feelings, experiences, and new revelation, often through self-proclaimed prophets, is one form of Christian mysticism. Because we have God's completed word, we are not to seek after dreams and visions or extra revelation from God. While it is possible for God to reveal himself in dreams and visions today, we should be aware, <coughs> uh, beware of the subjective nature of feelings and spiritual impressions. We don't, we, well, I've learned a long time ago, we can't, we can't trust our feelings. It is, a, it is vital to remember that anything a Christian experiences must line up with the truth of the Bible. From a religious perspective, the word implies the union of an individual with divine or absolute, some kind of spiritual experience or trance. This characterizes the worship experience of certain churches. The phenomena can vary in form and intensity, but the tendency always is to be replaced with the authority of the written word of God and with one's own, not with one's own subjective experiences. In any case, the Bible loses much of its doctrinal function in these circles, and the Christian remains vulnerable to his or her own experiences. This kind of subjective religion does not provide a safeguard against any deception, especially the end time ones. And God says about the end times, don't be deceived. So the only way not to do that is to go to our Bibles. Matthew 7, 21 through 27 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wondrous wonders in your name? And then I will declare them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it had founded, been founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words, sayings of mine, and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So there's a strong tendency in postmodern Christian world to downplay the relevance of biblical doctrines, regarding them as tedious echoes of an obsolete religion. In this process, the teachings of Christ are artificially replaced by the person of Christ, arguing, for instance, that some biblical story or another cannot be true because Jesus, as they perceive him, 
would never be would never allow that to happen as it is written personal feelings and taste end up being criteria for the scriptures or even rejecting outright what the bible clearly teaches often about obedience to god as with as which jesus said is so essential to building our house on the rock and it's easy for us to look at the bible and interpret it in a way that suits us and many people do that today so let's take a couple of minutes and look at what the bible has to say about doctrine so if you're to do a word search on doctrine you'll find it's in the bible 55 times now what's interesting about this to me there's several points that are interesting but one of the most interesting points to me is that you see doctrine only six times in the old testament but you see it 49 times in the new Temp testament and when we see something over and over again it's because god is emphasizing the importance of doctrine in the christian life here so let's review some of the new testament scriptures and i've got about six here and and it's interesting as you go through it because they they fall a bit into categories so first the one of the first scriptures on doctrine has to do with the ch church leaders in mark 11:18, it says and the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him for they feared him because all the people were astonished because of his doctrine so his doctrine didn't didn't go along with the scribes and the pharisees of the day and so they wanted that their their way of dealing with it was to kill christ christ and number two christ said beware of the doctrines of the scribes in matthew 16 12 he said then they understood that he didn't he not did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread but the doctrine of the pharisees and the sadducees then the bible goes on to say don't be tossed around by every wind of doctrine <clears throat> ephesians 4:14, 4, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plottings fourthly teach only christ john second john 1 9 says whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of christ does not have god he who abides in the doctrine of christ has both the father and the son he also says that there will come a time where we're not, we, that many will not be able to hear sound doctrine. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So they want to, the, the, the masses want to hear of those teachers that are teaching them things that are lovely and... and filled with um yeah i don't condemn them of anything right that don't get in the way but it's all wonderful beautiful flowers and and roses six um teach commandments of men matthew 5 9 says in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men it's interesting to me that you see this same scripture in Mark 7:7, 7, 7. exact same wording. And as you look at the Bible, one of the things that you you look at when there's like two, a definition of two, in the Bible often rents, represents verification of facts by witnesses. So remember, in the Old Testament, you had to have two witnesses. So it's interesting that these two there's these two scriptures that say do not uh, uh if, if you worship in vain if you teach doctrines commandments of men and Jesus says, very, very, very. yeah yeah so i'm going to finish by uh, a quote from ellen white from the great controversy those who think that it matters not what they what doctrine they believe so long as they believe in jesus christ are on dangerous ground the Roman inquisitors who condemned to death the untold numbers of Protestant believers in Christ, those who had cast out demons in Christ's names, had believed in him. The position that it is of no consequence what men believe is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. He knows that the truth 
recede in the love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, and another gospel. David, can you tell us about Monday near-death experiences? You know, when I first, uh, thank you, Byron, thank you, Barbara. When I first heard about this near-death experience, I was a college student, and I was watching the, uh, not college, uh, medical school student, and I was watching the Moody's documentary. When people die, uh, supposedly, and they come back, and they have different experiences they remember, and it changes their life. So let's talk about it, because as Christians, we really need to understand this, and we need to be able to tell people the truth about it. What does Bible say about uh, soul? Soul is living. That's the, uh, the, when you're dead, it's not living. A living soul can alone praise God, choose God. Ecclesiastics 9.10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So at death, there is no lifelike experience. Near-death experience claims that d during a clinical death, that means a person without a heartbeat, generally, Barbara, it's a person going through cardiac arrest, CPR, sees the afterlife maybe through a light or something that they feel that's really warm and fuzzy. Sometimes they have out-of-body experience. Some of them actually gets to re-examine their life to see what they could have done better or what they're looking for. And actually, when their heartbeat returns, apparently they remember these things and they, they're changed. And some people use this, like Mr. Moody, and he did his research and says, hey, this is a claim that life doesn't stop when the heart stops you know, permanently, it moves on. And guess what? They're, they're saying that there's a continuation of life, life after clinical death. Now, we need to focus in the word clinical here because nowadays we have more tools to do studies, and studies show that during a CPR, up to one hour, there can be spikes in brain activity. And when there are spikes in brain activity, guess what? A lot of things can happen because our brain is a very complex or organ that not only has neurotransmitters and organic tissue, but it also harbors life experiences, feelings, our emotional status, how we are born and how we are raised in situations. So all these experiences that people talk about, they are also based on the, pe the people that actually uh, their worldview. So their interpretation of the near-death experience is uh, based on their personal life. Science also shows that um, uh, people, uh, when they go through cardiac arrest, there is a component of stress, fight and flight response, and there is a change in sudden change in uh, consciousness. And so you have the REM, that is the deep sleep, but before that, you know, you have this vivid dreams versus uh, your awake state, and between that clash, there's that light that comes in, into the reticular activating system. So science are figuring out that, you know what, near-death experience is not Mr. Moody, what he used to claim to be and people wanted to believe because now we have more tools. And also one thing, when he uh, you know, did the study, he never reported the negative experiences of the near-death uh, near experience. There are a lot of people who have negative experiences. So that is important for us to remember that they're not always good. And also we know that um, uh, when, um, uh, when this uh, happened, the near-death experience, it's not always during cardiac arrest. Some people, when they have syncope, when they pass out, right before they pass out, they can have this type of visual light and all these things. So it's not related to death always. Also, depend on people. Some people, if they believe that they're dying, they're terminally ill, guess what? Some people actually experience something called outer body experience. And in that experience, they can actually try to figure out what they're missing, who they long for, and what they want. And that's not you know, uh, near-death uh, near experience, but people want to claim it as near-death experience. Another thing we learned that near-death experiences, these things that people see, it's not based on anybody's religious values. People can believe in God or not believe in God, but they have similar um, you know, events or similar things that they see, which goes to tell us that it is associated with most of the time, our physiological and psychological experiences intertwine with that. Also, um, you know, um, we know that these people, 
Most of them, I mean, they're all, you know, they come back to life. That's why we know this. So are they really dead, Byron? Right. Yeah, they are not really what dead. What you say with well, the heart stopped beating? <laughs> yeah. Well, was it for a minute? Yeah. Or 30 seconds or an hour? Or an hour. And then as we know, brain waves go up to an hour or more, right? Right. And there's conditions, drugs you can take where you mentioned a condition where you are completely still, you, still and you're not using any oxygen. Yeah. So they you're can't able even tell you're dead. Dead, yeah. And in Africa, they have a drugs that they can do. People can be in the grave for one or two days and without dying. So what does the Bible say about resurrection and death and resurrection? Well, we know that John 11:39. Um, I wanted to uh, read that here. It's uh, Jesus, uh, Mary, uh, Martha actually tells Jesus that don't open the tomb because there is a stench. Lazarus is dead for four days. So four days dead stench. And Jesus raises Lazarus. Does Lazarus ever talk about near-death experience? No. Nope. No, he doesn't, right? Then Jesus raised a 12-year-old girl. Okay, this is important. This is in Mark 41, uh, Mark 5, 41 to 43. What I want, uh, want us to focus on that story is that this girl was really sick. So he was, she was sick and she died. But when Jesus resurrected her, guess what? She was not only alive, but she was completely normal. She was walking around. So there's like a double miracle, okay? And this girl never talked about that she had any kind of near-death experience. You would think if that happened, it'd be kind of important, maybe. Absolutely. And then the third one that Jesus did was that, that he touched the coffin. He didn't even touch the young man who was the son of a widow, and he told him to get up, and he got up. And here, we, you know, there's no uh, discussion about near-death experience. So, uh, the, and then the Sabbath school lesson does a good job of talking about the other aspect of near-death experience, which is supernatural cause. And in this case, if we are talking about near-death experience or life, uh, life lives on after death, immortality of the soul, we know who that doctrine is professed by, right, Barbara? Oh. The first false doctrine professed by what? Satan Amen. in the Garden of Eden. So yeah. Satan is the name, so Lucifer is light. So 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, he disguises as light to deceive us. So the Bible says the dead knows nothing. Satan said you know what? You shall not die. So, so what, what, you know, who should we believe? Adam and Eve chose to believe Satan. And as such, at the foundation of our earth, our nature has changed. We decided to always believe ourselves, and we always want to believe this immortality of the soul. This is like our natural tendency. But we have to remember that, uh, that death is the enemy of God. This is the fire enemy, and they, God is going to cast this enemy out. I think we talked about it last Sabbath school, right. at, in the lake of fire. And that is, so how can death be friendly? It cannot be friendly. Near-death experience makes the death look friendly. It talks about how there's a new life. It's like an enlightened life, right? And even the formula for a soul is you need the breath of God, a yeah. body, and then you become a living soul. So, How could you be anything without your body? Absolutely. And then, um, and then like Satan told Eve, you will be equal to God. You're going to be a different enlightened state. Death is not that. Death is, you know, what, what, death is sleep, the first death, and second death is permanent destruction. So there's this um, gentleman named Jack Dukan, I think. He's one of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, gentlemen. He explained this very well. He said that near-death experience deceives people, so people feel like there is no need for second coming of Jesus Christ. There, Jesus Christ's uh, work is not, you know, it's not necessary. In essence, it, it tells, uh, you know, it kind of teaches that there is no God. God doesn't even exist because we're immortal to begin with. So what's the, what's the purpose of moral life or repentance if we're immortal and there is no consequence of committing sin? Another thing that near-death experience uh, you know, kind of implies that, you know what, live today. You know, YOLO, you only live once. Live today, live happy because there's an opportunity in the afterlife, after you die, that you can examine your life and make, you know, still get, uh, you know, eternal life. Kind of like the purgatory situation, you know, that we know that uh, some other churches uh, teaches. So the bottom line is, friends, we're going to get these questions. Even ourselves, sometimes we have questions about our personal life and death as we get older and older. But we need to remember what God said what, and what Satan, how he deceived us. He said, live today. Go by your emotions, not go by the word of Jesus Christ. 
we need to go by the word of Jesus Christ. Because when we go by our emotions, when we look at the fruit, it's good to eat, it tastes good, it looks good, and it makes you smarter. Guess what? I'm going to commit sin, I'm going to go against God, and I will be lost forever. Thank you. Amen. All righty. We're going to go on to Tuesday, reincarnation. So you say, what is reincarnation? So we all know it has to do with being born again, but... Um, a second so, chance. Exactly. <laughs> Reincarnation is a pagan belief that the immortal soul lives through this life and after death inhabits another body as it's been born. In the lesson, it states that the Hindus believe that the eternal soul goes through a progression of consciousness or samsara in six classes of life, aquatics, plants, reptiles, and insects, birds, animals and human beings including the residents of heaven so i could end up as a praying mantis or a god reading more on this where you reincarnate depends on how you acted in the previous life have you ever heard of something called karma mm -hmm. oh yes we have other pagan beliefs um, believe that you live a human life so you're not in the animal world um over and over again until you learn enough to make it to some form of heaven, whichever they've chosen, or prove yourself bad enough to go through some form of hell. And the only way you would be end your reincarnation is going to heaven or hell ultimately. And you'll see a lot of this in the New Age world and things like that. They have things like it's called past life regressions. What was I like in my previous life? Because they have that firm belief that they lived before. No, no, this is a human only. Okay. The, the, Hindu, or the insect is a Hinduism. I know, we got to keep it straight. The, there are many different forms of path. I had no idea there was so much reincarnation. Um, so Leroy Edwin Frome, who is an Adventist, wrote this article a while back. I actually got it from the Ellen White website on a different form of reincarnation. Animism as the basic, basic belief is so often from the Latin word anima, meaning soul, holds that all things alive or lifeless, a stone, a tree, an animal, have not merely a visible self, but an inner essential self that makes them what they are. These inner selves are conscious. They have feelings and within a logical range of relative strengths, they can take revenge if they are disturbed. And this falls into more of the spiritual energy thing and stuff like that, what we discussed on the opening. Believing in this universal inner reality, the African naturally takes human immortality for granted. After physical death, the human soul goes to heaven for a while, but then returns to reside in or near the family but until it is reincarnated in the same family group as a baby. In African society, the new child does not take after his late relative. He is that relative. While awaiting reincarnation, souls expect to be honored ceremonially and to be notified of matters affecting the welfare of the group. If treated with proper reverence, they bring luck. If neglected or offended, they punish the living by causing misfortune. I'd be, if, if I was getting misfortune, I'd be hoping that reincarnation soon, huh? And the final type of reincarnation, at least this is what I found, is having the same soul incarnate into a different person for the same religious position. Any guesses on that one? The Dalai Lama. So, in Buddhism, it is the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama to be precise. He chooses the body that he will reincarnate into apparently. But the trick is that they have to find what person he was born into. To find the next Dalai Lama, the high lamas have, may have visions or dreams to try and find signs. For instance, in the previous Dalai Lama was cremated, they would watch the smoke friends look for the direction in which the smoke goes. 
apparently I'm guessing the soul would ride with the wind because that was the direction that it would be reincarnated in. Once found, there are a series of tests of things he would remember or know about, etc. There's a lot more to it, but you get the point, right? So let me ask you this, though. If you had reincarnation, if it was really true, and you knew that you could go around as many times as you wanted to, what would be your motivation to be a better person? And don't get me wrong, because even in Buddhism, I've met some Buddhas that are more Christ-like than most Christians I know. But let me ask you, do these incarnations contradict with the Word of God? How does spiritually, why would we as Christians have an issue if we follow the Bible? Well, I'm going to have four reasons here. And the lesson actually, I think, has five, and some are similar. Can I tell you something? Yes. It's not, it's not they're really good people, but right. they're still merit-based. And when it's merit-based, right. it's always a problem because only God is perfect. Right. <laughs> and it's not, it's, it's yeah. my works. It's exactly, merit-based. We're yeah. working our way into heaven, and yep. that doesn't work. That does not work. It will never work. <laughs> so this contradicts the biblical teaching of the mortality of the soul. The body and the breath of life, as we covered earlier, yeah. and the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 23. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. That means they're not doing anything. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, and so also in Christ all will be made alive but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. after that those who are in Christ at his coming. So if Adam brought death into the world, how could we be immortal? The second point is we are saved by grace, not works. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And, not, or, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as you, a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. <laughs> Third point is, makes the cross and the resurrection of Christ meaningless. Luke 24, verses 6 through 8. He is not there or here, but he has risen. <clears throat> and this is at the tomb on Sunday. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and then the third day rise again. <clears throat> and they remembered his words. So if the soul is immortal, we don't need a resurrection, apparently. And if you go through cycle after cycle, it's pointless. And then finally, it negates Christ's second coming. John 14, verses 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go there to, or go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So we are either asleep or we are alive. And there's nothing in between until Jesus comes. Remember, it's not that what people believe, it doesn't make them a bad person like with the Buddhists, but everyone is based on the light they've been given. But we're supposed to, as Adventists, share that light with others so that they might know the truth and come to salvation in Christ Jesus. Barbara, can you tell us about necromancy and ancestor worship? Of course. So as we look at necromancy, if I, if I put it just, sum it up bluntly, it's, it's speaking with the dead. Yeah. And 
is if you look through time, and this goes all the way back to、um, early, early years of of this earth, we see that this was a custom,、uh, especially in in pagan worship. But God said in Deuteronomy eighteen ten、uh, and eleven. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or daughter pass through the fire, that uses divination, or is an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer.、Um, so, looking to the dead for answers is is not what the Bible tells us to do. A good example of this, as we see in Samuel, is King Saul, and I'm sure that most of you have heard this story. But now,、um, we, we, as we look at, as we come upon the story of King Saul, Samuel had just died, and Saul was inquiring to the Lord. The Philistines were on their way, and Saul wanted direction, and he wasn't getting it. He went to the Lord. The Lord didn't answer him in dreams. The Urim didn't tell him what to do on the priest's garment, nor were the prophets giving any answers. So, he decided to go to、um, a woman who find a woman who was a medium that would help him. And he sent so he sent his his、um, <clears throat> servants out, to, and they found this this woman in Endor. So Saul decides to disguise himself and go see this woman. And she's a little bit guarded because, in the kingdom, Saul had、uh, banished or put to death anyone who who looked at、um, contacted familiar spirits, and so they had to assure her that it would be okay. And so, when she saw Samuel coming up, she was very upset. <laughs> And、uh, she felt like Saul had deceived her,、um, and so she was really quite afraid. But and he he encouraged her that it would be okay. So we're going to start in verse fourteen here now, and it says, "So he said to her, 'What is this form?' And she said, 'An old man is coming up. He is clothed with a mantle.' And Saul perceived it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now." If this was Samuel, he would not let Saul fall on his face and worship him. Even the angels don't allow the, themselves to be worshipped. Now Samuel said to Saul, "Why you, have you disturbed me by bringing up Sam?" And Samuel answered, "I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me any more, neither by prophet nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you." That you may reveal what I should do. Then Samuel <clears throat> said, "Why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy, and the Lord has done for Himself as He spoke by me? For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord nor exercise His fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, the Lord." Has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me, meaning they would be dead. And the Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So this devastated Paul. Immediately he saw fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And or who he thought was Samuel. Now there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day. So they worked with him and fed him, and he finally ate and went out. And First Chronicles ten, thirteen and fourteen says, "So Samuel died for his transgressions, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he had not kept. And he also asked counsel." On one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and it, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him, and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. 
And the Bible's very clear in many places that we are not to deal with spirits or mediums or sorcerers or necromancers. And at, in, in biblical days, if they, they were doing that, they were stoned to death. They were, they were, they were put to death immediately. We see in Leviticus, <clears throat> give no regard, Le, Leviticus 19.31, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Leviticus 20 says, person who turns to mediums and f- familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Leviticus 20.27 um, any of these who are familiar spirits shall surely be put to death with stones and their blood shall be upon them, which means there's no hope for them. And in Deuteronomy uh, 18, 19 through 14 says, when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. And neither should there be any uh, among you who make his son or daughter pass through the fire so, or persecute or, or practices witchcraft or soothsayers or interprets omens and sorcer- sorcerers who conjures spells, medium, spiritus, or calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination. And so God continues. Even Isaiah talks about do not go to those who, who speak and mutter, but only through the law and the testimony. So we see that <clears throat> throughout the Old Testament, this was a practice and God, um, that God clearly forbade, and yet people continued to do it and participate in it. Um, Isaiah 19.3 says, The spirit of Egypt will, f- will fall in its midst. I will destroy their counsel and they will consult the idols and the charmers and the mediums and the sources. So we see that many people went to these mediums and sorcerers. And we even see that today. How many people go and uh, call up dead families? We see this uh, even in our, our leaders. There have been many presidents and vice presidents and, and uh, people in, in the government who literally go um, to spirits. Yes. Not even presidents. Reagan yeah. was really into it. Yeah. Yeah. Supposedly a devout Christian, right? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> and, and Clinton called up Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah. 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 So we see that this, <clears throat> this is something, a practice that continues today. And I'm going to end by reading Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 299. 299. In this age Satan holds control over those who depart from the right and venture upon his ground. He exercises his power upon such an alarming manner. I was directed to these words, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Some I was shown gratify their curiosity and tamper with the devil. So they may not believe in it, but they'll tamper. They have no real faith in spiritism, and would start back with horror at the idea of being mediums. Yet they venture and place themselves in a position where Satan can exercise power upon them. Such do not mean to enter into this deep work, but they know not what they're doing. They are venturing on the devil's ground and are tempting him to control them. This powerful destroyer considers them his lawful prey and excuses and exercises power upon them, and that against that is against their will. When he wishes to control themselves, they cannot. They yield their minds to Satan, and he will not release the claims, but holds them captive. No power can deliver the insared snow soul, but the power of God to earnest prayers of his faithful followers. Oh, I can't help but think how many times have kids used a Ouija board? Oh, it's not real. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. I hear that when you use it, something bad happens. No, nah, it's yeah. just, it's, it's a doorway yeah. to get you into something else. Yep. So Thursday, personations and other appearances. David, can you tell us about this? 
I told you about my experience at the beginning, but yeah. let's just get into this. So let's get into this. You know the word personation. You see people um, like Alec Baldwin was impersonating Donald Trump for a while, and then suddenly he got in trouble. You know, this is what happens when you make fun of people, even you don't like somebody. <laughs> so good le lesson learning. But here, um, so this uh, is a personations and other appearances, right? The first personation, uh, the first, this happened in heaven. Satan said, you know what? I speak for God, and he deceives the angels. Second time this happens on this earth is where? Garden of Eden. The serpent speaking like Jesus and speaking softly, eloquently, with logic, tempts Eve lies that fill with the truth, right? It's always mixed in. And he tells Eve that he has the best interest of Eve, not God. That's why he wants Eve and Adam to be um, fully knowledgeable. And this is how he started the deception. He gave the knowledge of evil. Don't trust God in his word, and you will surely not die. Why did he do that? Well, Jesus said because he is the accuser from the beginning. He is the father of all lies. And um, when Adam and Eve chose to believe him, guess what? They took his characters. Yeah. So they became accusers, and they liked to. Uh, their, their heart was, uh, all the human heart was filled with violence, so God had to destroy the earth with flood. Same thing when Jesus tells us to believe in him. Guess what happens, Byron? We attain the character. Same, yeah, same character as Christ. Christ. So this is why believe, faith and belief is so you're, important. You're transformed by beholding. That's right. So Satan now has a problem, right? His time is near. He is destined to die. He wants to take as many as with him. He's like a roaring lion. But he has even a bigger problem. Guess what? Jesus already won. And the gospel has been preached all over the place. Holy Spirit is on the move. There's press was invented. Bible has been printed. It's the number one selling book in the world, right? So Satan knows that he changed humanity at Garden of Eden. And that's what he's banking on. Why? Because now he can use human beings as impersonator of him, acting like they're part of Jesus, but actually they are following Satan. See, people have no faith in God, and people like us, we are all selfish. We are like accusers, not forgivers. So what does he do? What he's been doing throughout the whole generation, he uses people to lie, he uses dreamers, he uses soothsayers, fortune tellers, people that seek the dead, Jesus said, why seek the dead when you can see God who gives life? So, what, what, how did he, what, did, what are the examples? How did Satan impersonate you know, how, um, himself in, on this earth? Well, Jesus said in John 8, 44, he called Pharisees sons of the devil. He, Christians, we can be the impersonator of Satan. Peter, Jesus says, get behind me. Satan, Matthew 16, 23. Judas, it says, Luke 22, 3, 6. And Satan entered him. And what does Jesus say to the, uh, them, uh, to Peter? You are not mindful of God's will. And what does the Lord's Prayer say? It says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. So, anyone who uses their wisdom, knowledge, understanding for money and the worldly gain and for this worldly kingdom can be used as impersonator of the devil. So, well, another thing, when I, go ahead, Bear. Well, and even that, it just <laughs> personifies the myth that your soul is eternal. Absolutely. Well, you know, Unc, our Aunt Betty's been gone 20 years now, and yet she's back. She's back. There must be something to this. Exactly, and they impersonate the dead too, right? And they, so They know things, mm -hmm. they know, they act like them, they can speak like them. And you know what's interesting that you brought up? Um, People are now is calling dead pets, uh, pets. You know, dead pets. They believe that the dead pets can communicate with the loved ones that are dead and bring oh, messages. Really? Yeah. So there's that new, you know, psychic with the animals, right? So I'm, I'm sorry, but I thought <laughs> I hadn't heard about. It. I had neither. I thought yeah. Jesus died for people. I'm sorry, but it's but true. yeah, that's that's what's going on. So guess what? When I don't have the fruit of the spirit, I am potentially can be taken over by Satan and be used against God, against Jesus, against 
our fellow brother and sister. Ellen White says in Revelation 16, 13, 14, that there's three frogs, three unclean spirits will come out and they do miracles. And people would unite and go after them, marvel about that. And that's what Satan's going to do because his goal is, again, what? Appear to be impersonate Christ, impersonate and heavenly being so that people can believe him over Christ. So what, um, what, what is the problem is, what does Mrs. Ellen White say? She says, that because our faith is not firmly established in the Word of God. What is it? Word of God. That's the scripture, but essentially is Jesus right. because he is the Word. He also says, Satan works with all, this is amazing, Satan works with all deceivableness of unrighteousness to gain control of the children of men and his deceptions will increase. It will increase. So we got to expect all types of deceptions. It could be anything, spiritual to physical to anything. But two things Satan cannot do, right? He cannot raise the dead. Yeah, right. He cannot appear to everybody at the same time. And he will, uh, Christ will not walk, walk on this earth. Right. So Christ will not set his feet. With his voice, the dead shall rise. Satan cannot do that, but he can pretend that dead is rising like Barbara mentioned, Saul thought that Samuel was rising from the ground. So another distinction that I actually found, uh, uh, realized, Jesus never did any of his miracles for his personal glory. He right. gave God the Father glory. But these people, this uh, impersonator of Satan's, they are all going to do it for their glory and glory on this earth. His, his demons will impersonate yeah. the disciples as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Barbara. That is important to know. And so the bottom line is, you know, anybody, anything can be an impersonator for Satan if we don't have our faith in Jesus. And that is the purpose of Christian life. That is the purpose of gospel. See, and every, every time we seek our own glory, we can be a vessel for Satan. So what to do? Well, Paul says it in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. That is very important. It is the armor, armor of God, right? Armor of God. Guess what? Armor of God, if Paul keeps saying, put on the whole armor, not just, you know, helmet of salvation or the shoe, you know, the peace the girl, and the girdle of truth, all the armor, because it has to work together so there is no weak spot, right? So first one is girdle of truth, right? Girdle of truth. What is true? God's word. Who is true? Jesus, right? It's all about Jesus, actually, uh, ultimately. Every part of the armor is about Jesus. Breastplate of righteousness. Whose righteousness, Barbara? Jesus. Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jesus, uh, and it protects our heart. If we have Jesus in our heart, guess what? We're not going to be selfish. We'll always be forgiving because that was Jesus' you know, final word from the cross. Forgive them for they do not know they, what they do. Gospel of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace, right? Um, and then shield of faith. How does the faith grow? Faith grows by hearing and speaking the word, word of God, God, right? The more we discuss about Jesus, guess what? Our mind is filled with Jesus all the time. We yeah. don't have time for internet browsing, Facebook, none of that stuff. We fill our mind with Jesus, hey, Jesus, hey, Jesus. all those are tools of the devil. You stop that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, uh, not always, but mostly. Most, most, yes, but it starts as a gate, gateway, right? It's kind yeah. of like a gateway uh, drug, right? And also the helmet of salvation, not the crown of salvation, but the helmet of salvation difference. We need to have the helmet to get the crown, right? Yeah. What is the helmet of salvation? It protects our mind. It protects our mind from thinking anything other than <coughs> Jesus. Psalms 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight is in that word of the Lord, and in his the word, he de, uh, de, you know, day and night he meditates. And the last one is the sword of the Spirit. You know, Barbara, what's interesting? I did the statistics. I was looking at it like you, Barbara, uh, Byron. Christians that go to church regularly, less than 33% actually pray daily, less than 30% pray twice a week, and 12% never prays. Okay, this is a yeah. sad thing because, uh, you know, the most important thing about Christian life is these three things. Number one, scripture. Number two, uh, prayer for the Holy Spirit and understanding the Word of God, James 1.5. And the third thing is um, the... Um, the third thing is the confess the name of Jesus to one another. Even if we are not able to speak to the public, we can do that to each other. So I challenge you all from this Sabbath school lesson is this one thing. If you're spending uh, eight hours a day, at least eight hour, four hours and one minute for, has to be for God. That's the majority of the time, right, Baron? For eight hours a day, you're doing your work. 
but four hours and one minute, it's challenging. Oh. But that has to be with prayer, scripture reading, and confessing your name, uh, confessing the name of Jesus to others. Now, we got to do it. Otherwise, we run the risk of being deceived. It I've, is important. <laughs> I've always heard you have to spend at least an hour or two in his word a day. Exactly. <laughs> and if you do morning and evening worship yeah. and a little extra, mm -hmm. it usually works oh. out. Thank you, Barbara. I'm out of time, but... Friends, we have to do it. We have no choice. Otherwise, we will be impersonating Satan. Thank you. Barbara, final comments? Um, I think from this lesson, the important thing that I got is we need to know our doctrine. Absolutely. And Indeed. we need to know our fundamental beliefs. And so spend time in your Bible. Spend time letting the Holy Spirit teach you and guide you. Because... People, humans can steer you wrong, but the Holy Spirit will never steer you wrong. Amen. Pray for that all the time. And I want to read something from the Spirit of Prophecy, page 370. <clears throat> he has power even to bring before men the appearance of their dead, departed friends. And that's Satan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many are confronted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven and without suspicion or danger, they give ear to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. When they have been led to believe that the dead actually return to communicate with them, Satan causes those to appear who went into the grave unprepared. They claim to be happy in heaven and even to occupy exalted positions there. And thus the error is widely taught that no difference is made between the righteous and the wicked. Everyone goes to heaven. The pretended visitants from the world of spirits sometimes utter cautions and warnings which prove to be correct. Then as confidence is gained, they present doctrines which directly undermine faith in the scriptures. With an appearance of deep interest in the well-being of their friends on earth, they insinuate the most dangerous errors. They f the fact that they state some truths and mm -hmm. are able at times to foretell future events gives to their statements an appearance of reliability. And their false teachings are accepted by the multitudes as readily and believed as implicitly as if they were the most sacred truths in the Bible. That's what Satan's done from the beginning. When the serpent spoke with Eve, was the truth mixed with lies? Absolutely. Of course it was. Yeah. Where did that get her? More trouble than she ever wanted. <laughs> We need to know our scripture, as you said, Barbara, we need to know. We need to know God's word, not just have someone teach it, but to read it and know it for ourselves as well. Because if we don't read God's word and have the Holy Spirit there to help us understand it properly, spiritual things are discerned spiritually, then we will be in Satan's hands as well. If he can deceive a third of the angels who were in the presence of God, without God's word, what chance do you think we have? Trust God's words. Even if you don't understand it completely, trust that he knows what he's doing and he wants the best for you. It's not what you feel or what you think or what you believe is right. It's what God says is truth. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you because you are our only hope. Lord, the devil is working overtime, and as we see from Scripture, we're at the beginning where he's going to work miraculous things. He's going to do miracles to even deceive the elect. Only those that are rooted, rooted in Christ Jesus will be able to stand. In Ephesians 6, with the armor of God, three times it says, Lord, stand firm, that we might stand firm in you, that we might trust you, Lord, and that we believe your word, not only in our minds with an intellectual knowledge, but in our hearts to where we practice it daily, 
Lord, our prayer is that each one hearing or watching this, that your Holy Spirit may touch their hearts and minds, that you might open your word to them, Lord, and that they might have wisdom, which begins with, it says, fear of the Lord, which is really a reverence for you. Our prayer, Lord, is that everyone might stand firm in the end and that all might be taken with you at the second coming. Lord, guide, convict, and if need be, even nudge or push that we might have the truth, the truth in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, and praise your glorious name for all you do. Our Father in heaven, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. Thank you.